works on the left. That is us, but as pictures. And sir, we want to focus in on top lane as we run into this one. Yeah, definitely a super hype matchup. Nuggery coming off a world championship victory. Probably the best top laner in the world. Very flexible, great on carry picks. Has shown versatility in playing tanks and even things like Lulu. Flandre coming in with his second wind onto EDG. I'd say having a very good first series. Having great performances on things like Aatrox and Volibear. So this will be the hype matchup on the Rift. It is one that we've been waiting for with EDG being hyped up over the top and FPX returning to form. One series played by each as we enter Summoner's Rift. Now, we're not going to see pick ban here, but we can talk a little bit about the compositions lyric as the Jayos, I have to pause, are coming through. In Hongqiao, in Shanghai, and I can hear Doombi's wife always with the iconic voice hyping up Fun Plus Phoenix. Now, sir, walk me through FPX to start things off because we have some different picks with the Hecarim standing out for me. I think the defining thing for FPX is comp in my mind is just how much scaling they've obviously went for. Hecarim wants to get towards that first item. Typically is the Triforce. We sometimes do see Divine Sunderer. Victor, of course, is going to take some time to ramp up. The Aphelios as well, still being one of those true three item carries. Obviously very front to back oriented. Uh, has good engage and follow up engage coming from, you know, top jungle and support. For the side of EDG, I think it's a lot more fun because we have a lot of early lane prio. We've seen Orianna typically does do quite well into the victor in early lanes. So that'll give room for JJ to go and find an advantage in the jungle matchup. Of course, he's going to clear quite fast. Renekton up in the top side should have pushed priority against the Orn. And then a very burst heavy bottom lane. So I feel like this composition is a lot about enabling JJ to kind of... Uh, dictate his will and find the advantage that he needs in the jungle matchup. And EDG should be the team that's expected to get ahead in the early game. So we should be looking towards how they get ahead, in, as you mentioned, towards JJ and his pathing. It is a bottom side start for both these junglers, but JJ will eventually be heading towards top side and that scuttle. So if we don't have any beefcaking going on between Tien and JJ, JJ there, then we expect to see maybe what? Towards mid, towards bot, coming back to where they started. I think for JJ, when you have this matchup like Renekton versus Orn, you typically would only look for a gank like in your first clear when Orn isn't that tanky yet. You do have the point clicks yep. you see from the Renekton, so we might see that. I don't think we'll see any attention paid towards mid from JJ, though Tien is wrapping around. Very different story with Ghost. He wants to find Scout or at least get the flash against the wall. Scout's limited here. Wants to get over the second wall and will eventually do so, but FBX with a great gank time. Punishing the push that will come out from Orianna in this matchup. It is going to give Duinbi a bit of breathing room. And one thing we need to highlight, right? Victor is one of the famous champions for Duinbi. He played it a lot early on in his career, of course. He tasks his two styles of play. The bruisers like the Kled and the Renekton, but then scaling mages like the Rise and the Victor. So I think this is a really uh, hype pick for a lot of FPX fans. But... Like I said, this is going to be stock and standard for, for FPX. Tien's going to look for opportunities that are given to him. Then it's about those later 5v5s. JJ, I think it's more about getting ahead in your side lanes where you do have the point and click CC to set up for those Nidalee Spears and start snowballing this game forward. Which is what you said, if he could get up into that top lane in the early levels of Orn, still clearing away the Gromp as he gets Scuttle Crab. Pings are actually going down, but there's a defensive ward placed by Nuguri. So let's see how he goes surviving this one. Yeah, Flandre, of course, does have his abilities up. And they get the stun with Bellow's Breath is used. Good timing. Nuri gets the knockup. JJ runs on in. The pounce, the flash. Nuri running for his life. But all it takes is one more auto as JJ gets first blood. And it's beautiful to see one thing we have seen a lot with this new EDG roster in their first series. Tien. Okay. Wrong way goes against bit. the ward. But Mako's going to run on in, trying to neglect this one a little bit. Viper here too. Chris with the death sentence. But Viper with a fantastic dodge. Yeah, and, you know, at least Tien is going to be able to get a bit from this uh, Krug camp. An, inter an interesting thing to note that happened on the top side was that Nuggery did end up canceling out Flandre's recall, so that could pre be pretty big if Flandre is now forced to TP back to lane. But Chris, you know, just, just a lot of trading, a lot of handshaking going back yep. and forth. 
I want to touch on a point I was making earlier that EDG in their first series did put a lot of attention early game towards Flandre. It's not necessarily about camping his lane the whole way through. It's giving Flandre a bit of an advantage and then having the faith that Flandre, of course, can find those solo kills and kind of bring it home for EDG when they transition to playing more for Viper. We had a really big segment about it as this kind of sets him up too. Nuguri was the first blood for EDG and just a simple gank. Exactly, right? You have the point click CC coming out from the Renekton W. Again, you typically only want to gank these types of lanes very early on when you don't have the resistances coming out from the Orn yet. They play off the window perfectly. And we're going to see JJ coming out from base, clearing once again. It does look like he's going to try and head down towards the, the bottom side despite his Gromp coming up. And I'd like to see us get to a point, probably will be more towards that level 6 mark, where we see JJ trying to set up Viper and Mako for success. I was going to say, because they're suffering quite a bit. While we've entered this game quickly, LWX and Chris have been dominating the lane. Bit of a chaos storm through the mid lane to force out Scout. We'll take note of what happens next soon. But that's a 20 CS lead for Aphelios and Thresh. Obviously, part of it coming from Tien's uh, hover of bot side. True. But one thing to note is that both of these teams' first series was against OMG. FPX's bot lane was solo killing OMG's bot lane. EDG's bot lane was getting solo killed. Looks like they're following that through. JJ going to be moving to get the priority through the mid lane as Scout's low on mana, low on HP, because Doombi was shoving pretty hard. So nice little bit of pressure from EDG's jungler as he passes on through. Yep, just helping him get the nice recall. Of course, we saw Doombi get uh, a better back and come out with an early tier. So Ken just spam that E and put a lot of pressure onto Scout. So Scout now going to get a, a nice recall of his own, have the tier, so he should be at least able to match the wave clear that Doombi's putting up. And also time out to come towards this dragon because Tien is hovering around the bottom side once again. Let's see if this gets started. Chris also on the move. And so FPX really putting their eggs in the bottom lane basket. And we're, we're just seeing, I think, Tien respond to what JJ has been doing again. They're, they haven't necessarily been the aggressors. They saw JJ top first, so they were hovering around bot. And now it's just making sure EDG can't go for this play. Flandre does still have TP, though, and Nuggery doesn't. Okay, so that's a big advantage to note, and EDG are getting the respect they deserve because of it. So Tien just backs away, even Scout moves down. So EDG securing the first dragon of this game, number one, leading into a cloud. So we will have an Infernal or a Mountain, which is very big for this team that you said wants to pace out this game and use that Orn as the key engage. That's the thing is... I don't really like the how little agency FPX's comp has, especially in context of them being FPX, right? This team that has played so well around uh, having a lot of early prio in mid lane and, and linking up with Tien and setting him up for success, even if Duinby, okay. you know, before was known for a lot of these picks like the Victor. We're gonna pause for Mako, don't we? As Death Sentence enables the play, LWX has the shurikens. We've missed Ninja Gaiden here in the LPL, but L LWX is showing us it still very much exists. But let's go back to the agency discussion. I think it's quite interesting. You're right. It enable Their comps usually enable early success. Yeah, it's definitely what we've seen more of from the side of FPX. Or it's typically putting Dwinby on Rise and kind of funneling him on the farm and letting him dominate through a side lane. But that's definitely not the same play style as a Victor. And even now, them starting up this Herald, we do see their bot lane roaming first. I wonder if EDG will just flat out give it up, but I don't think Viper and Mako's tempo will be that far behind if they did want to come and look for the roam themselves. But it looks like they're just going to stay. Yeah, Scout's going to hopper in the mid lane, just waiting for the wave to approach him. Maybe Viper and Mako get something off this th for themselves because they were behind so much CS. They could get a bit of turret plating from this as well and catch back up in that volatile lane. Spear not going to land Tien. Gets the smite down as JJ challenges. Rampant charge at the ready. Tien takes a spear in the end and JJ's ready to pounce, but won't get there in time and EDG have to give that one away. And we do expect to see FPX use that towards the bottom lane. The fact that their bottom lane did get ahead through the kind of earlier kind of trades that were happening on the map should allow that. It's always interesting when you do take a Rift Herald. I don't think EDG should feel that bad that they give it up towards the side of FPX sure. because FPX don't have a great way of really enabling that push and breaking down a structure. I still feel like EDG can go back to hovering on bot lane. You still have TP on both of your soul laners to respond to an FPX play. But at least for the tempo now that Jej has provided, he's going to try and kill Nuguri once again. The Searing Charge comes back in onto the Nidalee. The flash behind the wall. Bellows Breath enables with the knockup. The Flandre gets low while Tien already backed away. 
That's the second time Nuggery's gone down and the second kill for JJ. Sadly, not much Nuggery can do in this position, right? It just kind of comes with the composition they've drafted and the position that he's in going against Nidalee and Renekton. It is going to be a lot up to FPX trying to find value on the opposite side of the map. We do see all four members hungry. Ooh, flash away though. Viper had to do that because TM was going to run over his face. So ADG's bottom lane survives for now. And yep, Kian at least will be able to pick up this uh, Scuttle Crab. He is behind JJ by only player. by one level now that he's gotten uh, that EXP. Okay. So not too far behind. We expected a deficit for FPX's comp. They just need to not let it spin out of control. I was going to say, uh, maybe a bit for me is a bit too much because, yeah, I, I see the Night Harvester and I'm, I'm making assumptions. 10 CS and 10 will be close towards that first item coming forward as Rift Herald on the bottom lane. You speak of tempo, it's a four versus three here. But Scout and Flandre have TP. EDG can definitely look to fight if they so choose. With the wave right in front of them. Ooh, LWX, Calibre. really aggressive ult. Yeah, he misses, though, with the Moonlight Vigil. So, FPX will back away after he gets the solo plate on that last one. FPX catching up in a bit of gold, but still behind, even after the push. We can see that uh, EDG didn't have any flank wards behind FPX's bot lane. There was a yeah. massive wave in front of them. You have champions like Nidalee and Kai'Sa that obviously like don't really do too well when you're throwing out those skill shots. So, EDG not able to go for any kind of counterplay. But again, FPX didn't actually pick up too much gold from that play. EDG are still in the lead, but FPX in a very comfortable position with the composition they've drafted. Yeah, that's true. You know, if you keep the gold within one, two thousand, even that's fine. A thousand lead for EDG is a prime example. Uh, I think also on your warding point, do I have to pause? Flandre's coming in for do and be. Maybe through this choke, will he flash for it? No, he's away and good dodge from do and be from JJ Spit. I like that you highlighted the mythics coming out earlier on, though. That is such a massive boon for the side of JJ and Flandre. They yeah. can potentially look for a repeat play. JJ definitely stronger than Tien at this point in time. And we have seen a lot of back and forth in the mid lane, but Scout able to instantly clear that wave. He does have a CS advantage, so still allowing uh, the room for JJ to play around with that prio. And JJ still likes that tempo. As Anugri was able to get plates on the top side, meanwhile, which is feeling pretty great. Again, you, you talked about composition. They don't mind being too far behind, but at the very least, the Orn staying relevant against Renekton is nice since he just built his Sunfire Aegis as well and has TP if something were to happen bot. Flandre's on his way down, though. Ooh, great hook from Chris. The Flay's there. Box down. Scout flushed down immediately. Double TP. Flandre's in first to Renekton versus five. Can he survive until his team gets there? Flandre heals up thanks to the Gore Drinker. An immediate flash away from LWX and Chris burning both their summoners. EEG whip it out and show us that that dragon's theirs as well. Yeah, that somehow worked out. Flandre TPing into five people. So of course, FPX back off and try to look for the pick. Some fancy feet and clean play coming out from Flandre allows him to escape. And because of that, all of FPX had backed off the dragon. The rest of EDG's members just walk up and take it nice because you lead into the infernal soul and lyric when you talk about scaling the infernal soul feels like it's a, a bit of partial imbalance if edg were able to acquire that early edg would definitely uh be in a point of power if they do pick that one up right we look across their composition they still have some late game champions the kaisa the oriana doing yep. quite well the thing that i think favors fpx a bit more is it just seems like like they have champions that do well if you come into them Aphelios and victor EDG's only real way of outranging you is coming from the Nidalee, but FPX also has their own engage tools with the Orn, as well as things like the Hecarim Ultimate and a Death Sentence from Thresh. As we saw here, I mean, this is at start of the engage, and FPX had to cut it back. It's actually hilarious, right? Because again, Flandre TP's in. It looks like a bit of a mistake. You highlight, though, he already has the Gore Drinker. They all turn on him. He slices and dices and flashes over the wall. So just kind of, again, very uh, intelligent play from him. Allows the rest of EDG to just be like, Okay, we'll take this dragon. And, uh, you know, again, the dragon, we already talked about what it leads to, but for the very least, you gotta remember, gives a nice chunk of gold for JJ. So he picks up a second one. He's still ahead by 10 CS in this jungle. Has the Night Harvester when Tien is still trying to get towards that Trinity Force by the look of it and, you know, finish off that build. And they're just gonna keep doing this, playing around the advantage in top side. The fact yep. that Flandre is going to pick up this turret uh, solo pretty soon, I think, makes this a pretty good decision. Just continue to have Scout hover towards the top side of the lane. 
keep having JJ come up, allow him to get that, and then you can start transferring that pressure around the map. Well, sir, it's been a fun early game. I'll say, you know, we were kind of flung into this. Our audience the same uh, because this one is in Shanghai, but I think EDG have shown us that you know, this aggressive early game fits the comp, fits the style. They know what they're doing, and they're 2,000 gold up. So the ball is definitely rolling. we just got to find out where the snow ends. As Tian is heading towards the bottom side, but Jej is here as well. This is a big nidalee, and with Night Harvester, the damage absolutely. And this goes back to what we were talking about before, right? That at any point, JJ can switch gears to just hovering for bot side, and FPX actually won't be able to make these plays. They won't. It's top lane. Meanwhile, this is a bit of an engage between the back of the turrets. Flandre at half health. Doesn't matter. No re survives. JJ still hovering about around the bottom lane here. Meanwhile, and top lane is not really the focal point because bot is still in question. Especially now with the fact that JJ doesn't necessarily need to be top to set Flandre ahead. He's just going to naturally yep. win this matchup on their own. And I like how they're using pressure. Scout just going and starting the Rift Herald while the other members of EDG are controlling vision on the bottom half of the map. So EDG are actually attacking both sides of the map at once. A nice, clever thing that a lot of the top teams do. So they should be able to secure the top side Herald while still securing Vision so uh, Viper and Mako can play defensively. Vision's been great. Look at it in the bottom side. Towards the blue buff, it lines up. They know where Tien is, as well as having the Scuttle Crab. So pings are coming out, and Viper and Mako don't give anything away while JJ picks up the next objective. Yeah, the turret's going to go down, but as Lyric would say, it's kind of a dead turret from the get-go. Again, it's a, it's a false sense of security, guys. You don't believe it. It has like, it has like 80 HP. It's not protecting you. Back off. EDG's bottom lane realizes that. It was already three gold for the side of FPX. We do expect it to be traded from uh, EDG. We see Nuggery backed off, which is the correct play. If you're going to allocate your jungler bot side and you know Jig is top, just back off. Go for the trade. Gold is still extremely close. Yeah, it really is. Back into two, two grand for EDG. I was going to say, though, the one benefit FPX got out of that play is first turret blood went to the carry that has the most gold on this team. He now has a Renan's Hurricane at 17 minutes in the game. So LWX is mighty fed. We are going to get a 200 years game, and we are going to get LWX in this next fight, which could be in 30 seconds putting out a bucket load of damage. I love that you bring up LWX because the highlight of this series had to be top, but LWX actually had a great series up against OMG. Again, him and Chris yeah. were dominating the 2v2 with almost no attention from Tien. Ooh, you can't interrupt though the Rift Herald as it gets placed down anyway, but a good hook from Chris. Nogri's joined up as well, Lyric, as Call the Forge God is here, and LWX, who we're just having a chat about, is going to help defend this. Herald gets the charge, but no turret right in front of Dragon spawning. No Moonlight Vigil, though. One thing we need to realize about EDG's comp as well is it does have a ton of burst. If they yep. are able to hit one member with an Orianna ultimate into an Italy Spear, they are probably just dead. Hunter is backing away while this is going on, though, and Tien sitting in front of the dragon wants to smite down. It's secured. Knock up, though, for Nogri is into the backline. Flandre is coming in red hot. LWX dodges away from the uh, W from Kaisa as Mako gets tagged on the way out as well. Blue buff might be sacrificed, but you get the dragon and your first one of FPX's game. I love the way the FPX played that. Uh, they realize their comp has more options, right? You feel fine. Call him the Forge God. Forge God, yeah, it's a re-engage. Chris flashes forward, double flash from ADG's response. That was a monk of W because FPX <laughs> wanted to force blood. See, when we look at FPX's comp, right, it has the engage tools available, but it has these zoning tools from Aphelios and Victor. They want you to walk in. You have some pick potential coming in with the death sentence. You have some peel as well. There's a lot of varied tools for FPX, and they feel great sitting in this kind of posturing stare down that we just had at Dragon. Creating the, un, uh, the awkward limbo, we'll call it, right, where... Things will go on. We burn a couple of summoners. That's great. The longer this goes, the more comfortable we feel with our composition. Is LWX sitting mid, but he's going to have to give up this turret. So EDG continue to push that gold limit to now 3,000 and open up the map with only one outer remaining. Now we're going to get some resets coming out. And, you know, awkward limbo is a good phrase. But you know what that phrase reminds me of? 
Do you remember that, like, game that I guess people used to play back in the day? So that, what was it called? Twister? Where you'd have to, like, put your hands yeah. on, like, the different colored dots? Oh, yeah. That's, that's what Awkward Limbo makes me think of, and that's where I think FPX were thriving in that dragon fight situation. They Except, want that. The you know, it, Twister, you know, reminds me of... It, Twister was never just... You know, you had to you had to be a little bit drunk. Let's be quite honest. And <laughs> it, when I when I think of Twister, I think of something else. No, 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 stop, sir. Just, okay, all right. Just... Look, hey, keep me keep me employed. I reckon. Let's keep me employed as a as a, a raring Australian. I, I like my Twister. I will just say that. But I agree. You know, like it, it does feel like a game of Twister, one that is a bit more PG than I almost got fired for. So <laughs> okay. this bit, this look, for look, FBX look, look. No, 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 is no, no, good no. play. No, sir, you, you need to stop. What, what we're going to talk about is, you know, there might only be two kills, but we've actually seen both teams using their pressure extremely well, right? Yeah. We've seen EDG consistently going towards topside hovering, and FPX a lot of the times making the answer play. The big problem where we haven't seen the kills is both teams have been very diligent with their summoner spells, being able to get away from harm's way and respecting with good vision control, like we saw here with Nuggery. I think Nuggery's, you know, been absorbing that pressure all game long and, you know, that vision control's been part of the element that's kept him safe in a uh, majority of situations. Only died twice, but has been hit pretty hard as we just saw there. Uh, Doombi's going to get a, a turret on the top side, though. So this is a very beneficial trade for FPX. And chat, I know you're expecting LPL to be fast, but with the first items, what we've talked about on our broadcast so far, with Mythics being the scale-up opportunity, expect to see some fighting with the next couple of drakes now that we are establishing items and getting past that stage. Especially with the fact that we do have Infernal Drakes, right? For the side of FPX, you could potentially get four Drakes into an Infernal Soul. That would be absolutely massive. I mean, I can just imagine dropping a Victor Ultimate or a Moonlight Vigil from Aphelios, and suddenly all of EDG's squad oh, yeah. will just be dead. So that, that obviously does go the other way with EDG as well, but already having the Cloud in the Ocean. Yeah, not going to be the most uh, beneficial in the long uh, scheme of things. At 1 minute 20 till the next Dragon, just to highlight that point. Flandre getting the push out in the side lane to enable this vision control to get even deeper. Look at EDG's ward line right now on the map. FPX pretty much have nothing bar a couple of control wards in the topside river. That has been a good use that EDG have been doing with the fact that they do have these early pushing lanes, right? They've consistently kept up their ward lines to know where the members of FPX are. The thing, though, is it still hasn't really led them to picking up many kills. And, I mean, they're only one Drake up over the side of FPX. Turrets are even, so... Yep. FPX have done a very good job of respecting a lot of the plays that EDG have made, and we've just seen we've just seen a lot of like trading of flashes back and forth. That's true. I mean, Chris usually the one to burn it out is burned his own pretty much off cooldown to make the play and get a response out of someone who's a bit more important. Scout usually JJ was in there before, uh, and farming back and forth will continue. Chat, don't fall asleep. I promise it'll get a little bit better. At the very least, we can talk about Mythics because we are 30 seconds away. Mythics and complementary items as Teleport comes in from Scout because he now has the Seraph's Embrace. So two items for both mids. As Mako going in, maybe I don't have time. Shockwave used. They found Dolby. He takes the Dark Passage, but he's already dead. Four versus five as the box has to be put down. And Flandre may have found a pick as LWX gets poked out with the spear. He's got a lot of shurikens, but Nookery now has to tank up. Versus four, I don't think that's the play. But the rain from Mr. 200 years as he gets the shield could turn it around. Nookery with the knockup once again. LWX, the range comes true. And EG may have low health bars, but at least they won the play. That was so tragic for the side of FPX. I was just about to talk about that if EDG can't get river control, they have no way of really face checking FPX's composition. Lucky for them, Duinby's aggressively trying to zone them out pretty much gives them a free kill. Nice play coming out from Mako to kind of lock him down. And we are going to see here in the replay, right? Duinby's aggressively playing forward. They're not letting EDG get control of River, but guess what? They're all very easily able to turn on to you. You have a 5v4 instantly. Great spear coming out from Jeju. They just keep hitting the carries of FPX somehow, but Flandre and the other members are going to go aggressive. Flandre gonna flash in here. Gonna put a lot of pressure onto the likes of LWX. You already said it. The fact that he was even able to deal so much damage on the back end of that was pretty amazing. It's, it's amazing because of just how close it was when the numbers advantage were stacked against them. Uh, another testament to this champion, I guess. But after that win, EG are now forcing soul points. So that was actually a, a bigger moment.
then I guess we're giving it credit for because now in four minutes, you can force Infernal Soul and you can put yourself in a very comfortable position to really roll out this mid-game red carpet. And it's crazy how such a small misstep did that, but I want to highlight what yep. we're seeing on our screen, right? The damage number from JJ, 39% in that fight. Ooh. Absolutely insane. This guy's just been on a tear this game so far. Again, he's been completely controlling the map, linking up with Flandre very well. And it's still nice to see this continuation of 2020 EDG playing around the top side of the map. The old school LPL fans would not be able to believe that. Oh, they'd be so happy. Seeing Viper in the roster is an even better AD carry than Hope. And not seeing clear love, but still a very strong jungle position from JJ's. FPX do manage to get mid lane turret, but still the gold 4,000 and that timer in the top left is what chat should be looking at. Unless FPX managed to clear vision and maybe force a play around the Baron Fog of War. The thing is, FPX's options right now are, as we talked about in our first series, right? They have to give up one side of, of Pryo. They will need True. to let Flandre win out like they did. They roam Nugri over and they try to force the numbers advantage play. They did that. They weren't able to find it. Flandre, of course, also does have TP, so he would be able to answer in an instant anyway. So EDG so far just using their uh, winning side lane in jungle to keep their chokehold on this game continues across bounty on four members of edg as well and third items pretty much coming across the board renan's now for viper with the collector a lyric while i talk about items before something else happens i just want to point towards nugri's item choice in going frozen heart second yeah it is pro i knew i didn't have time jedge is dead wow tn ran like a horse and chris flashed forward like a legend fpx have found a pick onto the jungler and now anything's possible. Uh, FPX, I'm kind of surprised they're not just going to start the Baron outright True. and, again, try to make something happen. They do have a confident scale, so they don't need to go for that same kind of 50-50 coin flip play we were talking on earlier. But they feel like they can win the fight. They still have a lot of key ultimates up. They have great turn with the Orn ultimate. And you've got Shurikens available for LWX. He's going to do this so fast, sitting with Severum as well. Look at it go down. The Baron play is being done pretty quick. It's called the Ford. Got missed by Nuggery. Doesn't matter. The Smite comes in. Yes. Epic secured the Baron. But now is the fight going to come with it as Viper moves into the pit and kills Tien. Epic left with four with the buff. Flandre runs out of Dominus as Viper ults into the back line. The LCK 80 carry almost manages to silence Doombi. It ends up being a one for one, but FPX get the Baron, so great win for them overall. The thing is, this doesn't matter in the context of if EDG get Dragon, this is still dire straits for the side of FPX. You want to see recalls come out for FPX right now, start using that Baron buff to push out these lanes and secure control of River and even EDG's bottom side jungle. You've got to get that pony with Ghost into position. On Sword of Shadows, Lyric will be available for the Dragon, though, to say. Nugri's ultimate, that's another question. I'm not sure if he's going to have Call the Ford God to supplement the engage for FPX to deny the soul from EDG. Still, though, we're, we're hitting a lot of critical item breakpoints on both sides, right? We have the Seraph's Embrace for both mid laners down. We even have some of the Orn upgrades starting to come out on the side of FPX with the Leandre's Anguish being upgraded. So, Aphelios on three items. I feel like if FPX could have a, a better formation, they could be in River and let EDG walk into them. They could definitely take this fight. Let's see. They're in a choke right now, waiting. JJ throwing out spears left, right, and center, and Nuguri now frontlining. Sends out, ready for the searing charge, and good zoning here from Doombi. Dragon will be started by FPX. And they're starting the dragon to try to bring EDG in. They're going to look for a death sentence or open call of the Forge God. But better smite coming through, Ooh. and it's secure. They stole the soul. Viper does it, baby. And now for EDG, despite the health bars, they have Infernal Soul. That's permanent. Like a good-looking tattoo, EDG have kept this game going. I feel like the only word to describe this game for FPX is tragic. It feels like they've really only made two massive mistakes. You know, they picked this comp that is a lot more scaling oriented, doesn't really have much proactivity involved in the early game. One fight mid lane, now losing the soul to a Kai'Sa. Really gonna cost them big in this game. We are gonna see a replay here. Does oh, walk up. Oh. Was that? Yeah, just an auto. Does get that one. And again, FPX not able to find the engage after that. We already saw the call of the Forge got opened. 
And now for EDG, they're going to be dealing so much damage. One Nidalee Spear, probably half or more of Doing B's health just gone. Yeah, at no, least he does. Gone. He does have the Banshee's Veil. So Doing okay. B actually what, sitting in one of the better places for the side of FPX. At least the second one would hurt a lot more, of course. Uh, I, I will say that, you know, that player, I was waiting for JJ to try and go in and get the steal because he's got a two-level advantage over TN. But just an auto se to secure Infernal, that's got to hurt with your smite. And now, Elder in 445. Baron power play was about 400 gold, which is abysmal to say the least. And EDG holding all the cards for this game with a 4,000 gold lead at 30 minutes in. Now heading towards three, four items. They want to fight again. They want to find this pick. And they want to shut FPX down in game one. And FPX, at this point, I feel like should take the next few minutes a bit more patiently. Shadow Solar Flare. Tien just kind of giga it. Flash away from Mako. Four versus five. Yeah, and well, the, the biggest problem is Flandre's bot, Scout is top. They have, yeah, oh my god, I, I don't even have words to stairs. That was a 5v3. That was not a 5v4. It was a 5v3. You had no reason to die right there. FPX just continuously giving over more advantages to EDG. EDG are just going to turn towards his top side and take this. Flange is uh. going to continue to win out in the 1v1. I don't know what you do right now if you're FPX. Well, you probably put your face on the keyboard, roll a little bit, and <laughs> just go for game two because that was tragic. And you're right, Scout gets a turret in the end. He pushes up to inhibit a turret. Now, Tien dying doesn't lead to, you know, the Elder or the Baron, but again, more setup, more resources for EDG to take after this. Let's see how this actually happened. Again, both of EDG's soul laners aren't here. Just ults in, gets instantly bursted down. This is what we talked about. They do have Infernal Soul, and especially two of these members are the the big fed ones on the side of EDG. Uh, not coordinated or thought through on the side of TN. Hey, but that's okay. You know, as TN, TN would probably say, worth a shot. I, I don't know. I've never met Tien. I'm not going to pretend like I understand his, his thought process. You know, I've met it him. feels like that could be the LPL mono. You know, we have yeah. all we fight for, which is great. I think that's also very significant for LPL. But worth a shot or give it a try, something along yeah. those lines. 2022, that's going to be a new branding, I think. is uh, yeah, Give it a go would probably be the year after as well. Roll uh, the dice, flip the coin. Yeah. Throw it in the bin, throw it in the basket, oh. you know, probably the year after. Hey, Lyric, I'll bring you back to the game. I won't put you in and get you in trouble because I've got a four-item Kaiser on my screen with Infinity Edge, and uh, Viper is huge. Someone we didn't really talk about, but Viper's big, and maybe Nuggery's not going to be. He's here in charge away. Mako gets hooked on in, though. Turn around from FBX, and speaking of turning around, Scout needs to run out of there. Four versus five on the other foot. With Baron spawning in 25 seconds, can they get any more as FPX reset to the midway? No, I think for FPX, just push this one out, go into river, take vision. You still have a lot of your pick tools available to you. Andre, Searing Charge is on to nothing. Crisp again with the death sentence. Baron spawning and Mako nowhere to be seen. The thing though is we don't have Call of the Forge God, so you're pretty much relying on a death sentence coming out from Crisp. And Flandre starts the engage. They want a four versus five. Viper jumps in as well onto Nugri, who's left by the team. They try to kill Flandre. Nugri runs into the pit so he doesn't die. That's only a one-man moonlight vigil with Viper. Ults into the back line to go golden. It's a massive bait as Tien onslaughts to his death. A double for this import 80 carry. A teleport from Scout to zone them away. FPX, you are up the creek without a big bloody oar. Because EDG walking towards the top side have everything on their table to eat. Crisp the final meal, all that's necessary to run this game home. EDG's bot lane got no resources this game, but that's not stopping Viper and Mako from stepping up big in these team fights. Viper's 6-0-1, that's how he's gonna end most likely into this game. EDG with a top side wave, first Nexus turret, Doombi back at the Nexus, trying to stop it, but he can't. Even without a minion wave, he'll die in the end as well on top. And EDG, 11-2 against the Fun Plus Phoenix. FPX find the pick onto Mako at the end. They feel like they can go for that Baron play, but good zoning coming in from Flandre. He does like kind of like bait them and pull them out of the pit, which then gives room for Viper to jump in. Of course, has a stopwatch. 
does buy a bit of time. You chain in these spears coming out from JJ. And one thing we've seen from this EDG squad so far is they have just really good team fighting, very good like chaining of abilities and like target focus. And it's really been a way they've been winning at least a lot of their games the past two series. And I'm seeing 2019 JJ 